Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today I've got something a little bit different and unique for you. You see, here on Nettle, I have been investigating many econometric tests of market efficiency, and today I've got an honor to present something that myself and my former PhD supervisor has developed uniquely on our own, and that comes from a recently published paper in Quarterly Review of Economics and Finance. And the title of the paper is a generalized seasonality test and its applications to cryptocurrency and stock market seasonality. The idea is to develop a simple yet powerful technique that could be used to test for general any seasonal patterns against the broad null hypothesis of no seasonality at all. And this particular test addresses a pretty common problem in seasonality and market efficiency research. That is, we know of some pronounced calendar anomalies, regularities on financial markets, but there are so many of them, and testing for all of them at the same time is first of all cumbersome, second, uh, might pause multiple testing concerns, as you are testing for, let's say, 20 different hypotheses, you're testing for Monday effect, Friday effect, turn of the month effect, uh, sell in May and go away effect, and so on and so forth. By the way, we've got separate videos on all of them on this channel, as you might have guessed. And, uh, well, if you're testing for 20 hypotheses at the same time, chances are you'll get some of them significant at 5% just randomly. So having one test, kind of a catch-all uh, tool, uh, at least as a first line of defense when you are investigating seasonality, would be welcome. And third, who said that seasonality is universal and uh, conforms to these established patterns of Monday effect, Friday effect, January effect, and so on and so forth, for all financial markets there are. And this is why the cryptocurrency tweak in our paper has been important, and that has been something that added value to the paper uh, at the end of things. However, today, I'll show you the implementation and the logic of the test based on our usual guinea pig, S&P 500 index. And we've got five years worth of data since um, end of July 2017 until end of July 2022, so quite recent data, quite um, relevant for day-to-day um, uh, -day runnings of the financial markets. And um, the concept behind the test is also quite simple, and uh, I quite like it aesthetically, personally, because it combines three of my arguably favorite uh, techniques in one. From the finance side, from the finance side, it is a market efficiency test, and I absolutely love them. From the econometric side, it involves a dummy variable regression, which is also a technique that I constantly promote on this channel as well. And from the mathematical side, it involves prime numbers, perhaps one of the most exciting phenomena that exist in mathematics. So let's roll. First of all, we have to index our observations. We'll start from zero, then add one, and go all the way until the end of our sample. And we'll see that we've got 1,258 prices, which nicely corresponds to five years worth of data. Then we can calculate log returns. Again, you can proceed with simple daily returns, holding period returns. It wouldn't matter that much. I'll use log returns here just to spice things up. Natural logarithm of the ratio between consecutive prices or index values. And we get all returns for five years worth of daily data. And then prime numbers come into the picture. And here I have pre-entered all prime numbers up to 100 in these cells over here at the top. And what we're going to do, we're going to combine them with the index to produce, to generate our set of dummy variables. And the dummy variable implementation here is quite simple. If the mod, so the remainder, the whole division remainder of the index, and we lock the column here because the index is something we care about, no matter what prime number we're investigating, if the remainder from the division of the index of the number of the observation 
by the prime number. So here we do not log the column, but log the row so that we always refer to the same prime number in the respective column. If this remainder is equal to zero, so if it is wholly divided by the prime, then our dummy variable is one and zero otherwise. So quite simple, isn't it? And let's see what it produces. So for the prime number of two, the smallest prime number, it alternates between zero and one all the time. So it's equal to one if the number is even and zero if it's odd. But the same thing can be generalized to any prime number. For example, for the prime number three, it does produce ones every third uh, time and zeros otherwise. So if the number is divisible by three, three, six, nine, and so on and so forth. And we can quite easily generalize it throughout and enforce it throughout the sample. So here we'll see that this particular parameterization captures uh, prime numbers and whether a particular uh, return day uh, index is divisible by them. But of what use are they? Well, see, um, most seasonal patterns can be described as some cyclicality. So, for example, you can uh, conceptualize Monday and Friday effects as weekly seasonality or seasonality that is of cycle five, because there are five trading days in a week. And that would be picked up by this particular column, where you have got ones every fifth day and zeros uh, otherwise. So this particular uh, dummy variable kind of allows us to incorporate weekly seasonality or seasonality of periodicity five into the picture. But what about some exotic seasonality? Let's say we've got seasonality of periodicity six, like every sixth day something happens, or there is a cycle of length six that allows us to predict returns with some accuracy. Well, we haven't got six here, but that's why prime numbers are so fundamental to this concept, because any number, any integer that is, can be uh, uniquely expressed as a product of primes. So for six, the situation is quite simple. Six is just a product of two times three. And if we include both two and three as our uh, dummy variables, that is, dummy variables generated by two and three as primes, we would see that they overlap if and only if the number is divisible by six, quite naturally. Both of these columns generate one only when the number is divisible by six, only when there is a seasonality of periodicity six, that is. So seasonalities of periodicity six are captured by these two variables jointly. And that generalizes further. And one of the examples that we showed in the paper is that a typical trading month contains 21 trading days. So if we care about some monthly seasonality and in stock markets that's turn of the month effect for example returns being higher around the turn of a calendar month we would be able to uh, account for that implicitly using three and seven as our primes because 21 is three times seven what about something more long term something like an annual or yearly uh, periodicity something like a january effect with returns being higher every january every single year or sell and main go away effect with returns being higher at some point in the year and lower at the other time of the year. Well, 252, quite accidentally, is also very nicely broken down into smaller primes. More particularly, it's two squared times three squared times seven. So what we expect is if monthly and annual seasonality are present, we would see a lot of significant effects as soon as we include seven into our specification. However, if seasonality is predominantly weekly, we would gain the most uh, out of the model when we include five. And what is the beauty of the specification is that it needn't be annual, weekly, monthly. We can go as far as we want and test for any seasonality whatsoever, as any cycle periodicity can be broken down into prime periodicities, just as I explained with six equaling two times three. And therefore, this seasonality test is arguably a generalized test, allowing to test for any seasonality against the broad null hypothesis of no seasonality whatsoever. So let me show you how to very quickly and efficiently 
uh, implement this in AXA. Well, I have already showed you a couple of videos ago how to use the index function to refer to individual components of the Linus output, the output for the regression modeling. Here, let's recap that, because for our testing, we would need just the R squareds and the F statistics of models that include further and further amounts of those dummy variables generated by primes. So to first retrieve the R squared of our baseline model that only includes the first a dummy variable generated by uh, prime two, we would need to specify it as follows. First, we use the Linus function and we refer to our S&P 500 daily returns. And here we'll lock them both row and column wise and that remains our dependent variable no matter what. We care about efficiency and seasonality in S&P 500 after all. And then as our X variable, we refer to the first um, cell in the two column and we lock it both row and column wise and we refer to the last cell in this column but we do not lock it as if we drag it across we would get an expanding sample of x variables so if we drag it here we would get the prime number three included then it will get five included and so on and so forth conforming with the pattern of this template over here that i pre-made and then we do need the additional statistics because we want to retrieve the R squared and the F statistic from the template. And then remembering where it occurs in the template, I have already uh, discussed it many, many times on this channel, that um, R squared occurs in the third row of the Linus template and in the first column. So 3, 1 should do the trick. And it retrieves the R squared for uh, our first uh, regression model. And then we can copy this paste it into the fstat cell and change this three into a four because the fstat in the Linus template is reported exactly in the fourth row and in the first column. So four one is what allows us to retrieve the F statistic for our model. And then we can drag it across for all of our specifications all the way to 97, which is the uh, highest, which is the largest prime uh, smaller than 100, and that would allow us to include 25 primes into our model. And then we'll just need to calculate the number of residual degrees of freedom. That's quite simple. We've got 1,258 returns, so we lock that, and subtract one, because we always include a constant, and that is degrees of freedom reduction, and subtract the number of coefficients, the number of primes we have included so far. And that calculates the residual degrees of freedom for all 25 of our models. And then finally, we'll convert these F stats into P values to determine the significance of the explanatory power of a particular specification. That would mean that we'll need to use the right tailed F distribution, plug in the F statistic, then we'll plug in the number of coefficients, which is our first degrees of freedom parameter, and then the residual degrees of freedom is our second degrees of freedom parameter. And that allows us to calculate the P value. We can drag it all the way across and see how the p-values evolve as we include uh, higher and higher primes, higher and higher cycle periodicities, uh, higher and higher number of dummy variables into our generalized seasonality test specification. And as I alluded to before, we get a large drop in the p-value, uh, a large spike in the f-stat, which would mean a large increase in explanatory power as soon as 7 comes into the picture. And that's no coincidence, simply because 21 is 3 times 7, so 7 comes into the picture when we talk about monthly seasonality, as well as 7 comes into the picture when we talk about annual seasonality. So when 7 is included, the explanatory power of our seasonality test jumps. It increases quite a bit. And we see that we never go as low as 0.16%, meaning that 7 is the most significant cycle periodicity that contributed the most to the explanatory power of our seasonality test. However, as for now, we cannot uh, decidedly argue that there is seasonality, or significant seasonality that is, in S&P 500 returns, simply because here we have got arguably the same problem as with the many seasonality tests that I have explained before. We have tested 
25 hypotheses at the same time, meaning that our result is potentially vulnerable to a multiple testing criticism. So how to avoid that? Well, if we had independent hypotheses, we could have used something like a Bonferroni or a Holm adjustment, and I've got a video on all of these types of multiple testing or family-wise error rate adjustments over here, so check this out if you're interested. However, here we are not concerned with independent hypotheses because obviously we're applying ever-expanding sets of dummy variables to the same uh, dependent variable, that is, SP500 returns. And for dependent uh, hypotheses, the go-to technique is the Wilson harmonic mean p-value, which is basically just a harmonic mean, which is the uh, inverse of the sum of uh, reciprocals times the sample size of our p-values for individual hypotheses. So we can just use the harm mean function and calculate the harmonic mean for all of our p-values. And again, I've got a separate video on harmonic means and I've got a separate video on these particular adjustments. And we've got a Wilson harmonic mean p-value of 1.14%, which means that our seasonality that we detected is statistically significant at 5%, since this synthetic p-value is less than 5%, meaning that there are uh, significant seasonality effects in S&P 500 returns. And what we can also deduce is that they are focused on the cycle periodicity of 7, since this is when the p-value of individual hypotheses drops the most, and that's the lowest it ever is. And that can be further conceptualized or explained, interpreted, in the breakdown of further cycle periodicities that are associated with a month or a year, uh, as both of those contain seven in their prime factorizations. And this is how you use prime numbers, dummy variables, in one generalized seasonality test to determine whether your time series, not necessarily financial, uh, has seasonal effects in it. And that's all there is for the generalized seasonality test that has been derived by my supervisor and myself a couple of years ago. And if you would like to learn more about the test and see the original paper, it will be available as a link in the description. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make to see any further suggestions for videos on business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.